He was born in Bremen, Germany at the end of the first decade of the 20th century and emigrated to Texas with his family when he was seven years old. He was a good student and after graduating from Texas A&M University in 1931 with a degree in science, he joined the army and became a bomber pilot. He went on to further his education with advanced degrees in aeronautical engineering. After World War II, his interest in aeronautics blossomed and led to a career in the scientific and research field. He directed both the development of the ballistic missile program and the Air Force's initial space program and did it all in a very short span of years. I'd not only consider Schriever a visionary, I'd have to say that he might have been the preeminent visionary in terms of what the Air Force has become. His name is Bernard A. Schriever, and he is a legend of air power. By now, World War II was in full swing, and Captain Schriever was immediately sent to the 19th Bomb Group in the Southwest Pacific. While in the theater, he flew 38 combat missions in B-17s and other aircraft while serving as the group's chief of maintenance. He was only a captain for three months. In January 1943, his meteoric career began in earnest. And by war's end, he was a full colonel and commander of the advanced headquarters of the Far East Air Force Service Command, where he directed all combat support functions for theater operations from bases in New Guinea, the Philippines, and Okinawa. With the war finally over, Colonel Schriever was brought back to the United States and became chief of the scientific liaison section in the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Material in the Pentagon. While in this office, the young colonel was fortunate to work closely with the legendary Dr. Theodore von Karman, head of the Scientific Advisory Board. Von Karman took Schriever under his wing, introduced him to many leading scientists. It was here that he devised a revolutionary method of analysis called Development Planning Objectives, or DPOs. The DPOs helped identify promising advances in technology and coordinated these advances to meet future operational requirements of the Air Force. General Shriva was the right man at the right time to give us two things. A strategic, long-range rocket deterrent against the Soviet Union, and secondly, the capability to orbit the first Americans in space. And when we look at the work of General Shriver in the 1950s in building the ICBM force, we see here that Shriva draws on some of these projects uh, toward New Horizons, a long-range forecasting project of the late 1940s. He draws upon some of the work that's taking place in the physics community to reduce the size and weight of nuclear warheads, and he puts this together to give us the nuclear tip ICBM. The other person who's very important in this, in this discussion is Trevor Gardner, who was the assistant to the Secretary of the Air Force. And he's the one who put Schriever in a position uh, to realize the development of these weapons. Uh, Gardner and Schriever then set up a teapot committee, uh, which was headed by von Neumann, and they handpicked the members of that committee. And they concluded that if a crash effort were undertaken, uh, outside the normal channels of the Air Force that was free of in the, in institutional bias, then they could do that. And Schriever was in it every step of that way. And incidentally, Ramo and Wooldridge, Simon Ramo and Dean Wooldridge, who were young scientists who'd worked for Hughes Aircraft and developed uh, missiles for them, were also in on this committee, members of the committee. So a lot of this was, was cooked in, in early on in the Eisenhower administration. The, the irony of it is that the Eisenhower administration came in uh, with a program to cut the missile program, but then when they saw what the potential was of this thing, uh, and they were uh, supported enthusiastically by Schriever and, and, uh, and Trevor Gardner and John von Neumann, then the Eisenhower administration decided that this was the way to go, to get more bang for the buck, in the words of uh, Charlie Wilson, who was the Secretary of Defense that uh, development of ballistic missiles was something that uh, would uh, certainly help in the Cold War. Gardner asked Schriever to take over the program.
retriever agreed, but only if he could have full authority to get the job done. By now, Schriever was a new Brigadier General and was named Assistant to the Commander, Air Research and Development Command in June 1954. Two months later, the Western Development Division was created in Inglewood, California, and Schriever was named its commander. The assignment officially put him in the driver's seat to manage the ICBM program. Schriever proposed that the best way to proceed was to create a government industry partnership. He prevailed, and in short order, two partnerships were formed to make the difference in the race for the ICBM. The partnership of Simon Ramo and Dean Wooldrich joined to create the Ramo Wooldrich Corporation. At the same time, Schriever and Simon Ramo, who was chief scientist on the ICBM program, adopted yet another partnership. At about the same time that the Raymond Woolrich Corporation began, the intelligence community decided that the Soviet Union was a real threat in creating an ICBM with, that would bypass the entire multi-billion dollar defense system of the United States. And the ICBM program immediately became the number one crash program. Thrust at the center of a highly secret crash program, program that was considered by many experts twice as complex as the Manhattan Project, Schriever, Wildrich, and Ramo tapped into all the nation's technological resources, recruited the best and brightest from universities, government, and over 220 major companies. To maintain secrecy, now Major General Schriever and his Air Force team wore civilian clothes to work and operated out of the Ramo wildrich facilities. Besides the urgent threat they were laboring against on national security grounds, the government industry team gave birth to the systems engineering and electronics that later spawned the field of space technology. For their advances, Wildrich, Ramo, and Schriever all gained celebrity status in Time magazine in 1957. In the area of weapons acquisition, Schriever and Ramo fashioned a new approach to systems engineering. For reasons of time and speed, they took what Ramo called a parallel approach, or working on all subsystems at once. Later known as concurrency, it was a very risky approach, but it paid off. To succeed, breakthroughs had to be achieved in missile guidance, missile structure, propulsion, flight control, and nuclear warhead weight, all at once. But just as the ICBM program began to take shape, the Department of Defense implemented cost-cutting measures which threatened the pace of the project. But the measures were quickly dropped after the Soviets launched Sputnik in October 1957, shocking the defense community and nation and adding a new sense of urgency to the ICBM program. Ultimately, the United States succeeded and in the 1960s surpassed the Soviet Union and won the race for an operational ICBM and, as a byproduct, the space race. At the heart of these achievements were the government-industry partnerships conceived by General Schriever and exemplified by the teamwork of Schriever, Simon Ramo, and Dean Wildrich. General Schriever's achievements over a relatively brief span as head of the ballistic missile programs included the development of a new class of weapon systems, a second generation on the way, and the frontiers of space well marked. In April 1959, Benny Schriever was promoted to Lieutenant General and named commander of the Air Research and Development Command. His command was vast, and he was now responsible for managing the widespread military, science, industry brain power required to provide the Air Force with the military tools to do its job. To get the job done his way, General Schriever introduced his concept of concurrency to weapon system development and acquisition, the same concept that had worked so well for him at the Western Development Division. As before, he wanted complete control over the development and acquisition process. But he faced fierce opposition from the Air Material Command Commander, General Samuel Anderson, whose command controlled weapon systems production. Although the Air Staff in the Pentagon offered many compromised positions, none was accepted, and the disagreement went on for two years. The deadlock was broken 
when the Air Force was given the opportunity to be assigned full responsibility for all military space programs, but on the condition that it solve the split between Air Research and Development Command and Air Material Command. The Air Force Chief of Staff, General Thomas D. White, wasted no time in deciding in favor of Schriever when he established two new commands, Air Force Systems Command and Air Force Logistic Command. Schriever was promoted to four-star general and made the first commander of the new Air Force Systems Command. He reached the goal of total control and was now responsible for research, development, procurement, and production actions required to place a complete aerospace system in operational use. Although General Schriever had reached the goal he sought for so long, the administration changed, and the philosophies of the Eisenhower administration were not shared by the Kennedy and Johnson administrations with regard to the pursuit of technological advances. Schriever saw all the streamlining of weapon system development and acquisition that he enjoyed during the development of the ballistic missiles replaced once again with layers of review, or as he called it, paralysis by analysis. General Schriever found the administration's defense policy of mutually assured destruction, which meant the United States would fix its numbers of strategic weapons in the belief the Soviet Union would do the same, as foolhardy. He also thought the autocratic rule of Secretary McNamara irksome, and he could no longer support the administration's defense policy. Thus, he voluntarily retired on August 31st, 1966, several years before his mandatory retirement date. On June 5th, 1998, the Air Force Space Command's Falcon Air Force Base, Colorado, became Schriever Air Force Base, renamed in honor of General Bernard A. Schriever, the father of the ballistic missile and the Air Force's space program, a tribute rarely accorded a living person. If one looks for the legacy of General Shriva today, all one has to do is go to the Cape or go to Vandenberg Air Force Base because every time a military payload is put into orbit, every time a missile system leaves a launch pad, every time a commercial payload is placed in orbit, we are seeing there the legacy of General Shriva. General Bernard A. Shriva was born in Germany, immigrated to America when he was seven, and rose to become a great American patriot. He had a long and distinguished career in the United States Air Force, and as the father of America's space program, is a true legend of air power.